Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to the Royal Society of Medicine's In Conversation series. Now then, our guest tonight was going to be a Mr. Dominic Cummings. Unfortunately, he had a diary clash, so we've gone even better. And instead, we have Professor Anthony David, probably one of Britain's top psychiatrists, and definitely one of Britain's top psychiatrists, as I've said on many times, uh, Professor of Mental Health, Director of University College London's Institute of Mental Health, previous Professor of Cognitive Neuropsychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry, founder of the Journal of the Same Name, a prolific author, over 700 academic publications, including several citation classics. Hopefully we'll be able to get around to a couple of those. And uh, also, and this does not go without saying for many academics, an incredibly skilled and informed and in-demand clinician. Now, Tony is the author or co-author of at least 12 books on insight, cognition and schizophrenia, a famous textbook of organic psychiatry. Um, but I don't think of any of those would have got him to where he's been recently on Start the Week, Private Passions and the Literary Festival Circuit, which is the case with his latest book, which is called Into the Abyss, a neuropsychiatrist's note on the troubled minds. But um, Tony, can we just start off though? I mean, I think most people know what a psychiatrist is and they know the difference between a psychiatrist and a child psychiatrist, but you're, you're a neuropsychiatrist. What kind of strange hybrid beast is that? Oh, thanks, Simon. <laughs> um, it's perhaps not as strange as you might think. In a way, most psychiatrists started out as being neuropsychiatrists, actually. Um, but nowadays, it is that uh, psychiatrists is interested in that overlap between neurology and psychiatry. So it's the mental health of people with neurological conditions or brain injury, or the, the mental health of people who appear as though they have a neurological condition, which perhaps we're going to talk about later. Yep. But, but as, as my mentor, Alwyn Lishman, always said, that neuropsychiatry was not a sort of subspecialty of psychiatry. Uh, a narrow field all of its own, but it was the whole of psychiatry plus a bit more. And uh, that's the way I like to think of it. Well, what, what's the bit more? Just perhaps a slightly more on interest in the brain as a system uh, and, and as, a, as a functioning organ than is required of the general psychiatrist. Although, of course, you know, everyone has to know a little bit about the brain. Well, that's the idea, I think, isn't it? Yeah, true. But I mean, you, you, you're more than even a neuropsychiatrist as well, because you're a very difficult person to pin down on that. And, um, and that, indeed, one of the songs you chose in Private Passions was Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Down. I think that was for personal reasons. But if you think of psychiatry as often split into the camps of brain and mind, you know, uh, uh, an artificial distinction, but nevertheless, one that a lot of people have. You are remarkable because you mentioned the great Alwyn Lishman and you keep his organic psychiatry textbook alive. Um, but at the same time, you're also, um, you've written the introduction for R.D. Lang. You've written quite a bit about R.D. Lang, who could not be further away from, um, uh, from Lishman. So I just, well, where, where are you happiest? Is it in a, is it in a, um, in a scanning machine or in Hampstead? Because not many people can do both. <laughs> no, and uh, well, there may well be scanning machines in Hampstead, which would be heaven Ooh. for some. <laughs> but um, no, uh, I, you could say, if you were less generous, that I'm a, a jack of all trades and master of none. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have to struggle with that a little bit. Uh, I just am interested in too many areas. Um, and if we are being a little bit serious, there is this notion of the biopsychosocial model, which I think is, is very important and in a way was what I was trying to convey in, in the book. Um, now, it's, it's one of those cliches that uh, can be taken wrongly, that it's like a motherhood in apple pie, that it's about everything and nothing. But I think if you try and interrogate what it really means, that there is a sort of... Um, perhaps invisible, but strong connection between biology, psychology, and sociology and culture uh, that is in, indivisible and essential, and that you cannot really be a psychiatrist without understanding or at least attempting to understand all those perspectives. And indeed, that's 
the secret, I think, to trying to have a fulfilled life to, to understand all of those different aspects. Okay, fair enough. Well, let's move towards your book then. I mean, your book is, 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 a, is, a, is a series of case histories. And, uh, and I quite like the reviewer in the, in the Washington Post who imagines you, as she says, an, as an English house i.e. The, the TV series, forgetting obviously the house actually is English, but anyway, never mind that. Uh, but she contrasts the ornery, arrogant Dr. House with the compassionate, philosophical Dr. David. Um, so <laughs> compassionate and philosophical, Tony? Oh, I'll take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the, the image of, of House, this sort of brilliant, if irascible, um, you know, it, it's more like the cliche of the uh, the detective, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the detective series that, you know, against all the odds, he finds the truth despite everyone disbelieving him. I guess we'd all like to, I mean, the, 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 the satisfaction of making a diagnosis that has been missed or under, putting together scientific data and facts in a way that is new. I mean, it is very satisfying and occasionally one gets to do that. But uh, that in the absence of more human skills um, would be very flat and uh, sterile. Yeah. And, and I think, I don't want to get into this now because we'll probably do it later, but of course, mm. in the end, house's stories always resolve themselves. Yes. And in real life, of course, that's not the case, as in some of your cases, they don't. But, but the case history has a, a long tradition, doesn't it? Not just in TV series, but in some of the key moments in the history of psychiatry. And um, I think it's fair to say, you know, Freud was, was, was a neurologist, neuropsychiatrist, but probably was the person who wrote the most influential case histories we've ever had. I'm sure that's true. And, uh, you know, whatever you think of Freud, he was a brilliant writer. Um, some, some would say too good that, uh, you know, the novelist Freud sort of overtook the scientist Freud but he, his case histories are marvelous to read. Um, and then I think people like Oliver Sacks followed <laughs> in that tradition. Um, there's also a parallel tradition in neuropsychology, neurology, um, of the case study, if you like, uh -huh. the in-depth study of a person following a brain damage or injury, or with just unusual abilities, uh, like uh, Luria wrote about the nemonist, and um, there are other similar case studies. So again, it's if one could combine those two forms of uh, narrative, perhaps speculation to fill in blanks, as well as detailed yeah. observation and more objective recording. I think that's kind of what we're searching for. Okay, so you, you've already mentioned Oliver Sacks, who's, who's another of your, I, is he your, I'm not sure if he's your hero or not actually, but he's certainly someone you've spoken about and written about and talked about, and I've heard you on several occasions. Introduce us to the mind of Oliver Sacks, or the life of Oliver Sacks. Yeah, I, I, I think, yes, I would say he's, he's a hero in, in some ways, but he's an intriguing figure. And um, I asked the question as someone who started out doing a bit of neurology and really enjoyed neurology as a, as a sort of junior doctor registrar, but always thought that psychiatry was the more interesting specialty. Um, uh, why was it that Oliver Sacks, who seems to yearn to, to be a kind of a psychiatrist or to provide a psychological understanding, albeit in people that have been referred to him as a neurologist, why did he not think of becoming a psychiatrist or a neuropsychiatrist? And what does that tell us about the, main, the, the brain and the mind, if anything? And uh, so I why, do you I, think, I, why do you think he didn't? I mean, I think most people would almost be surprised to know that he actually was a neurologist because he doesn't write like that. So why do you, do you think he was just ashamed of it or it was just infradig, you know, not as prestigious? Well, it could be all of those things. Of course, I never knew him. I never was able to ask him those questions or I would have loved mm. to, but he did write a, an autobiography and there's some clues there. Um, one that he had a brother with very severe schizophrenia. And oh. especially, especially at a time when there weren't any good treatments for schizophrenia. I mean, he, but he did realize and um, live long enough to benefit from antipsychotic medication. 
uh, which which Sachs uh, rightly saw as overall beneficial, but causing quite considerable side effects. You know the Parkinsonism that that comes with the dopamine blockade, and of course he's very attuned to uh, dopamine blockade. So that might have been one thing. Uh, the other thing that I sort of speculated about um, was that he was gay and he was made to feel very ashamed of that by, according to him, by his mother uh, and by people in the profession. And he might have felt that it wasn't possible to have a good career and be openly gay back in those days. And uh, I'm, I'm not, I, well, I, I, I had a look at what literature there is about attitudes in the medical profession in the 60s and 70s to, to homosexuality. And, you know, there were some studies that actually showed that different specialties were differently tolerant with, as you might expect, general practitioners and psychiatrists being the most tolerant and open-minded. Of course. And, you know, I won't go on to say who was the least. No, so, I think we all know. <laughs> and, and then he, he, of course, was uh, Jewish. And mm -hmm. in America, if you're Jewish and a doctor, well, you almost have to be a psychiatrist, you might think, um, <laughs> which, again, isn't true uh, in the sense that there are, I think, 12 percent of American doctors are Jewish compared to the population of about 3 percent. But they're distributed across the whole specialty. So that doesn't really account for it very well. It does account for a bit, we're drifting off topic a bit, but I think Hitler had quite a lot to do with the, the number of Jewish psychiatrists in both Britain and America. Um, I think that is true. Yeah, um, so but, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. but let, let's, let's think, I mean, I mean, Sachs is, is, is a puzzling character, isn't he? And, and, and has attracted some um, barbs. I mean, Tom Shakespeare, the um, disability activist in this country, Sir Tom, in fact, um, rather, I, rather uh, sharply said, uh, described him as the man who mistook his patience for a literary career, um, which is quite funny, <laughs> if a little unfair. But I've heard quite a few neurologists kind of cast some doubt onto those. They just say, well, I've never seen anyone like that. It's, they all kind of are just a bit too good to be true. Do you think he embellished them a bit? Well, it, it's possible. <laughs> um, I think, though, other neurologists might be a little bit jealous that he got so much attention. Uh, there's always that. Um, but he made very good relationships with a lot of the patients. Uh, and a lot of them were just people who wrote to him seeking his advice and opinion. Um, and he won their trust and admiration and often stayed in touch with them for, for years and years and years. So I, I don't really think it's likely that he was seen by them anyway as, as sort of taking them for granted or exploiting them. Okay. Um, but whether he embellished it a little bit, I don't know. Not all of his cases sort of turned out well. Um, but mostly, you're right, there, there's sometimes a neatness about the explanations that you get yeah. in his books. Okay, well, let, so let's that. But again, that's po possibly the difference between neurology and psychiatry. We're much more used to uncertainty and untidiness and messy messiness in terms of uh, people's lives and the narrative. Okay. Now then, David Freeman has just interrupted our soliloquy to tell us that um, he uh, lives on the same street as Sachs, and he's got a, what they're setting up there is um, uh, they're presenting a presentation of Sachs' life online in September, including a new documentary and Sachs' partner in his later years. So he did, he settled down with a partner, didn't he, when he was um in the in his, in his last few years yeah which is which is very heartwarming to hear and i'm you know i'm really looking forward to seeing that documentary i think it'll be brilliant excellent so david will undoubtedly invite you to the opening tony then that's good um so let's get now onto on, onto your set of case histories which is what they are first of all your title into the abyss that's a, yes yeah what's that about well yeah the the publisher was not all that keen on it <laughs> and I, I and i've i now realize that there are quite a lot of books called into the abyss the most famous is about a plane crash in in uh, i think the canadian rockies 
um, where they all sort of the story of survival. So are they all eat each other? But oh, no, that's a different okay. one. Oh, okay, um, sorry. But uh, yeah, but I took it from a quote from a, a famous philosopher psychiatrist, Carl Jaspers, and he said that that no matter how much we might try to understand and explain people, our patients' experiences and find meaningful explanations for them. In the end, people with the most severe kinds of uh, mental disorder are not understandable. There is an abyss of understanding between us and them. And he, I, I don't think he meant it as a way that it might be taken as a sort of dehumanizing way of looking at people. It was just a sort of acknowledgement of our impotence and a, a sort of warning not to think that you do understand other people other than superficially and and i thought that that's quite a challenge and and uh i'm not saying it's right or wrong it probably is a bit of both but it seemed like that was a challenge to frame these stories of trying to understand perhaps the under the ununderstandable Okay, so here's the book, by the way. Ooh, I've just looked up and seen that I look a bit like a sundial. I might have to uh, change my position in a minute. <laughs> but uh, so here's the book. So I, I want to, let, let's start off with one of the case histories. This is Patrick. And um, I'm starting with him because um, it's linked just to also to, to something you've also done this week and, uh, and uh, we were keen that you talk about. So tell us a little bit about Patrick. It's a very obviously it's a complicated story they're all complicated but just just give us a quick thumbnail of what it was about Patrick that brought you know makes such a extraordinary read and obviously caught your attention well he was a, a young man with uh, all his life ahead of him um, he was knocked off his bike and he sustained a, a, a brain injury a head injury quite a serious one uh, was in hospital for quite a long time, made what seemed like a, an amazing recovery, but suffered some changes to his personality and his thinking. Um, he became very depressed, uh, but the features of his depression were, were quite unusual. Um, and he developed this belief and a delusion that um, he, wasn't necessarily alive. He might actually be dead and living in some kind of parallel universe that looked like the world that he was familiar with, but there was just a few things about it weren't quite right. Um, so that just seems so paradoxical. How could anyone believe such a thing? And yet it is a sort of recognized delusion in the, you know, in the psychiatric annals um, described by a French psychiatrist, Jules Cotard, Oh, yeah, 50 yeah. years ago. Uh, and, and he also had a delusion that people around him, they seemed to be familiar, they seemed to be people he knew, but they, according to him, weren't the real person. They were imposters in some way, fakes, which is another eponymous delusion named uh, Capgra delusion. And, you know, it seemed like more than a coincidence that he should have these two textbook uh, delusions. And so it was trying to understand what was going on there. And it seems that um, one of the core features was this, uh, this thing called depersonalization. Um, that if, if you have a very low mood and you're very uh, pessimistic about things, plus you have this feeling that you're slightly cut off from the world, then you're bound to think that, well, maybe the, the whole world's not real and that you're not alive. Um, and I was interested in this, it piqued my interest because I was already interested in depersonalization, which affects a lot of people without brain injury uh, at all. It, it's quite a common symptom. Perhaps we've all had it a little bit, this feeling that we're not quite real, that we're slightly detached from the world around us. We, we usually describe it as, as if I'm in a bubble, or it's as if I'm watching the world go by in a movie, but we know it's not really that. But nevertheless, it's a very disconcerting and uncomfortable feeling. And some people get that persistently and chronically. And it's been ignored by psychiatrists for, for a century and a half, even though it's there in the small print. And uh, uh, 
a, a number of patients have sort of got together and formed this charity called Unreal, uh, which is to try and provide support and to campaign for better services and research. And one of the amazing things that it does just by being there is to give people the idea that they're not alone and they're not suffering this peculiar state of mind that people often think is, is the harbinger of madness. So there are other people out there, they've had it, it is described, uh, and that in itself can be incredibly reassuring at least. Now, I mean, Patrick, actually, there was a, there's a striking passage you write when it turned out for a lo quite a long time and no one had noticed that, that he thought his wife was not his wife. Yes. Um, and, and it got kind of almost picked up and, and that he was, and it wasn't that he had a fleeting idea, he, he thought it wasn't her. Yes. yes. And, and, it, and his evidence for that was particularly interesting. And uh, tell know, us. They, were, they were a newly married couple. Yeah. Um, and she was, you know, a very fine woman. And um, she apparently liked expensive underwear um, and was quite particular about her clothes and her appearances, sort of li liked to, to spend what money they had on, on nice clothes, good, good quality. And uh, in, the, in the meantime, the, the, he had uh, lost his job, spent a lot of time in hospital, in rehab, uh, she having to look after him. So, you know, things were tight and she wasn't able to splash out on, on expensive uh, lingerie. Uh, he thought that that was such a, an important part of her identity. That it couldn't possibly be the same woman that he married going around in, in standard issue Marks and Spencer's <laughs> underwear. So the idea that he would sort of think it through and think, well, you know, maybe times are hard and she can't afford that, or maybe, you know, you know, we're all a bit older and years have passed and the first flush of, of marriage has gone. Uh, no, that for him was evidence that it couldn't possibly be the woman I married. And, you know, she would drive her up the wall. Um, and it just shows you that how sometimes a belief gets fixed and becomes impermeable to reason and evidence. But if you kind of understand why the person has got into that style of reasoning, it, it sometimes is possible to unpick it. And I think in that case, it was, uh, in fact, possible that he could question those beliefs. I mean, and his other evidence, highly relevant to what's about to start next week, that the world had been replaced by an alternative universe, was that Greece had just won the European Championships, hadn't they, in football? Um, That's right. Now, that could never happen. Yeah, yeah, yes. And, and, and is it possible to gently and slowly kind of reason with people to show that actually that could happen? I mean, not, not just say it did happen, because it did happen, but to use that as an example, you know, to use that to help them question their own, you know, view of this, this strange alternative world? Well, I, I think it can be. Um, first of all, uh, you have to obviously win the person's trust. And, and mm -hmm. if you get into a sort of confrontation, um, you know, as, as we know from, from ordinary life, people tend to stick even harder to their beliefs. Um, but once yeah, you true. establish some common ground, it is possible to point out, especially with someone who, who had the motivation and remaining cognitive ability to, to make use of that, to sort of unpick things and to, to point out how, especially in sport, one of the things that makes it so um, irresistible is that occasionally the underdog wins. And, you know, he was, he was a sports fan. Uh, so he kind of begun to understand that, that, that if, the, if, the, if the kind of favorite always won, how boring would that be? I mean, it'd be a bit like U.S. basketball, where almost <laughs> always the favorite wins. Yeah, and it did. It so happens that some mathematicians and physicists, possibly on a slow afternoon, did some calculations about which sport um, is the most predictable, and it turns out that football is the least predictable. That it's the the, the most likely that the 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 favored team actually loses. 
Um, and that's kind of possibly why it's so compelling because you just never know. Yes. Yeah. Well, I hope as a Chelsea fan, that's going to be true on Saturday. <laughs> um, if I can steal your joke, you do put in that you're a you wonder what would have happened, what has happened to him once Leicester won the Premiership at odds of 5,000 to one. Yes. Maybe he had a well, relapse. Well, no. well, that clearly did happen. In an yes. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. Now, um, Leslie Morrison, who must be reading about you, I don't know, Chaz, but has just talked, she's just asked a question and said, um, uh, she's talking about someone in her family who has um, agenesis of the corpus callosum um, and wonders if that is related to neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia or indeed what you're talking about. She clearly doesn't know that that's your PhD, isn't it, Tony? <laughs> isn't that right? Is this your sister-in-law who's just asked the question? I don't know. But come on, you must know the answer to that. Well, um, I did do my, my MD thesis on the corpus callosum. Yeah, so this yeah, is this, of course. <laughs> um, this this um, white matter tract that joins the two hemispheres together and transfers information between them. And uh, uh, what, one of those great neuropsychological case studies we talked about was what happens when uh, people have the corpus callosum severed uh, surgically as a kind of last resort treatment for epilepsy, at least they yeah. used to. And uh, people seem to live quite happily without uh, an intact corpus callosum until some people like uh, Roger Sperry, who eventually won the Nobel Prize, yeah. found that if you tested the hemispheres in a subtle way independently, you could show that they sort of had their own existence. And uh, they, they, it, it raised the question whether actually people have more than one sense of self or identity that um, thanks to the corpus callosum is, is integrated in some way. And that seems to be quite relevant to people with severe mental illness like schizophrenia where the sense of self is fragmented. And so there was the idea that maybe uh, people with those sorts of disorders have not severed, but there's something slightly wrong with the corpus callosum. It's not quite working correctly. And, uh, you know, I found that, that there was some evidence that the corpus callosum may indeed not be transmitting information as cleanly as it would in a, in a healthy person. Plus, there are these cases of people who are born without a corpus callosum at all. Um, but they, and they tend to have more mental health problems than the average person. Mm. But not, and a few of them have had a psychosis, and, and we described a few of those. Uh, but a few of them also have more autistic like syndromes, and some have other conditions, including epilepsy and intellectual disability. So it didn't seem to be a sort of magic bullet. Um, it's just another bit of evidence that people whose brains have developed slightly abnormally are much more at risk of some of these. Uh, neuropsychiatric mm. disorders. So I'm mm. not sure whether that helps uh, the questioner. Um, <laughs> well, at least she's heard it from the expert. <laughs> but, a, but, but at least people people were interested in, in yep. the relative your relative's condition. Yeah. Now, now let's to also mention then Christopher in in your account. So I want to move mm. to a different bit of neuropsychiatry, and it's a, that's an extraordinary case. Um, and well, I'll let you describe it. But what I want what I want to talk about is one of the things that Christopher had was non-epileptic seizures. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just describe the case a little bit of Christopher, just a little bit to take us into to the area of non-epileptic non seizures? Yeah, he, he, he was a young lad um, in his teens, um, doing reasonably well with nice family. Um, he did have uh, a younger brother with autism, quite severe autism, which was a, a big strain on him and the family. But when you looked for other things going on, there, there wasn't any real other uh, traumas or, or difficulties or family history. Um, and he sort of slightly became a bit naughty um, and had some rows with his family. Um, and one night he came back from having stayed out too late, very cold and shivery uh, and feeling a bit weak um, and 
rather than getting sympathy from, from his parents, he was told off. Um, and the sort of shaking and uh, weakness started to become a real problem and a real notice, something that was quite noticeable. And instead of just going back to school a couple of days later, he ended up taking to his bed. And, you know, amazingly and inexorably, it just got worse and worse and worse. And despite the doctors who would come and see him and basically would say, I can't find anything wrong, um, which is a common reaction, although leaves families and patients quite unsatisfied. Okay, well, <laughs> what is it then? Is the, is the natural question. Uh, and he ended up becoming completely paralyzed uh, and unable to go to school. Um, but the neurologists who saw him couldn't really come down with a, a diagnosis. And yes, every now and again, he'd have a sort of shaking attack, which looked a little bit like an epileptic seizure, but probably wasn't, or, or nobody really thought it was. And he got completely stuck like that. Um, all the different services saying it's not really our problem. Um, the family feeling rather guilty and um, that they should be dealing with it themselves. They didn't push for their son to get the correct treatment and, and he ended up uh, missing school and spending years like that until eventually he was referred to our specialist neuropsychiatry service. And uh, fortunately we had the ability to admit him to a neuropsychiatric ward. Um, and, you know, we were able to help him considerably and, you know, he walked out quite triumphantly um, and uh, had an amazing, amazing recovery. There were obviously lots of twists and turns along the way. Well, there were, and, and, and as you say, he, he had seizures or what could have been seizures. Mm. Uh, and they figure in a couple of other of your case histories as well. Yes. And, and they've always been fascinating, haven't they? Because mm. for once we, we have a very good test, we know that they're not epilepsy. So you can probably just, in, in a, in, just for those who are not in, in the trade, that we, we, are, we can be very confident with those that we know that they're not epilepsy. Why can we be so confident? Well, the, the preferred term nowadays is functional seizures, although mm -hmm. there's lots of different terms and yeah, you know, yeah. none of them are perfect. Um, of course, if, if in the middle of a, a seizure due to epilepsy, it's an EEG recording will, will show that, but also years of clinical observation tells you uh, what the hallmarks are. And of course, even the, the most experienced clinicians sometimes get it wrong. Um, but person with, with uh, functional seizures, they, funnily enough, they often have their eyes closed. And you wouldn't think that a person with epilepsy had their eyes open, but usually they do. You know, they're not conscious and aware, uh, but their eyes are open. Whereas mm. you might think that if you're having some sort of turn or blackout, you have your eyes closed. So that's a, that's a little clue. Just the kind of movements, you tend to get these sort of side to side rhythmical writhing movements in a non epileptic seizure, whereas, whereas epilepsy causes the, the sort of classic tonic clonic attack, which is uh, more violent, has a higher sort of velocity or, or, or frequency. Uh, and it, so it just looks different. The most epileptic seizures last a minute or less even, whereas the non-epileptic type functional seizures then tend to go on a long time, can go on for minutes, hours even. Um, so there, there are lots of clues there. Well, at the start of your career, before I even met you, you'd already written a paper, because you're a SWAT basically, Tony, but you had written a paper back in 1985 on, on a case of a person with, that was having non-epileptic seizures but went on for days and, and was in what, what doctors call status, that it was yeah. unstoppable and ended up being put on ITU and intubated. Yeah. Now, I mean, if you ever tried to have a non, have you ever tried to have a kind of grown mal seizure yourself? Well, I've tried it once just in front of a mirror just to see how long you can do it for. And it's about 30 seconds. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe two minutes if you're Steve Redgrave or someone. How just, what actually is going on? I mean, I've often, I'm, it's a serious question. How can anyone do that? How can someone fit 
you know, without yeah, I mean, electrical thing for, for five days. Yes, and one, one, one of the cases in, in the book I described as a sort of virtuoso in their ability to um, withstand pain, um, withstand thirst and hunger. Um, and you see that in psychiatry. You see the most extraordinary examples of self-denial. Uh, and on the other hand, you can see extraordinary examples of activity to the point of exhaustion. Um, it just shows you the power of the mind, if you like, um, how severe psychiatric conditions are. Now, I wrote out that case because I thought it was extraordinary that someone, that, that status epilepticus could actually be functional. And yet it turns out that possibly 30% of people admitted to, to hospital ITUs in status epilepticus have a functional seizure disorder. Good God. It really is amazing. And so that it is possible. Now, probably the mechanism is to do with dissociation, this idea of kind of splitting off what's happening in your body with what's happening in your, your mind and your aware mind so that you can withstand pain and discomfort and also that your body can just sort of do what it wants without apparently being under any control. Uh, I think in reality, what happens is people get lots of sedative drugs and you're not sure whether what you're seeing is is the mm. drug or a partial seizure, and the person is even more dissociated, they're even more dis disinhibited because of the medication. And so it just goes on and on and on. Now, several people, Patricia Gamboa, I can see is one, but many others have uh, raised the, the important issue about what's the relationship between non-epileptic seizures, dissociation and past trauma? Because I mean, there is one, isn't there? There certainly is one uh, that um, people with functional disorders in general have uh, much more difficult life histories. They're much more likely to have suffered abuse and trauma and neglect, um, perhaps twice or three times as much as, as, as the average person. But having said that, if you look at what we did a study where we just compared people with those functional disorders with other people who were had been inpatients in the Morsi Psychiatric Hospital. And there, the levels of uh, previous trauma and abuse were very high, uh, over 25%, 20 to 30%, which itself may be, is likely to be an underestimate because we we're just going by what was recorded in the case notes. But there was no difference. So, even if you accept that there is this very high rate of that kind of background, it's mm. not universal. No. Um, it doesn't necessarily explain everything. It certainly gives you a way into trying to understand and explain what might go, might go on. And the, the link with dissociation possibly is that a person who's being subject to some uh, trauma or abuse, especially if it's repeated, especially if they're young, may adopt a kind of a dissociation as a way of protecting themselves, of, yeah. of cutting off from what's going on with their body, if you like. And that that is quite a useful strategy at, at one point, but then becomes somewhat um, autonomous and kind of kicks in at the wrong moment, or even the threat of trauma or anxiety or fear and suddenly that becomes you know becomes the difficulty rather than than anything else and so and i think there's it's a very plausible story and there is some accumulating evidence that that might be a mechanism yeah and i i didn't see it but apparently lady gaga who i believe is a singer as they say um was describing very powerfully what she believes is the relationship between a, a, a severe sexual assault and her fibromyalgia. But I mean, it, that, it, that raises the question of how do we ever know that something is causal in you? Because it could be, or on the other hand, fibromyalgia is, is quite common and unfortunately sexual assaults are quite common. Yeah. Some things that make sense may not be true and other, yes. other links, and by true, I mean that there's not a link between the two. 
but other times things that may be true in the sense there is a link don't make any sense at all yeah. and you'll make jaspers out of it to say on this didn't he exactly and i think that's what he was saying when he was talking about connections between events that are meaningful that make sense and that are causal which is a different matter and to really understand causal connection requires something that we're not capable of and that's part of this idea of an abyss it's not something you can just work out by thinking about we would say well the only way you can establish causality is is through research and there are kind of rules that establish that and of yeah. course psychiatry has gone too far and in its search for causation and meaning has sort of ended up finding things that perhaps weren't really there and of course freud made that possibly made that same mistake and then went too far the other way and and perhaps never found the right equilibrium and i think that's a constant challenge for a mental health professional to, to get that balance right and you know we we it's it's impossible to know whether you if you do or not yeah no fair enough fair enough so um and then I also want to do another point that I'm going to raise now. Some of those others raise other points. I'll come to in a sec. But also, in some of your case histories, it really doesn't end well. And in some of them, I'm thinking of Emma, and I don't think you've got the time to fully describe it, but it's a situation that we're all familiar with where there is clearly, you know, bringing in, even though to the outsider it looks blindingly obvious, but there must be some psychological link uh, between their lives and their appalling symptoms is almost counterproductive uh, and both for the patient and in this case, in, in the case of for the patient and for the family. And you just wonder, well, was, it, was it worth it? Even if it's true, you know, because I've, I've been, been involved in a couple of cases where you just think, well, I just wish I hadn't said that really, even though I think it's true and relevant, the reaction sometimes is so hostile that you just sometimes think you've made things worse. And I'm sure that's happened to you, Tony, must have done. Yes, and I mean that particular case um, was was very difficult. And uh -huh. again, it, it was someone who whose problems began in sort of childhood and adolescence. And I'm not an expert in in child psychiatry, but but the the imperatives are a bit different with children. Um, that you know you you have to kind of speak out on their behalf if you think what's happening to them is wrong. Uh, not just abuse, but sort of neglect and misuse of uh, treatment. Um, so sometimes you have to uh, say things that are going to put you in conflict with a person's family. Uh, but I think I think you do learn that um, that that's a very significant and potentially damaging thing to do. And if you can work with families, even if they seem to have a different conception from you, seem to have a different uh, value system to you, and find some common ground, that's always better than ending up in a standoff. And especially since, despite how great we might think our, our profession is, uh, in the end, it's often families who are left with trying to care for their relatives. And if, if, if they found a way of doing it, um, when you as a professional or as a profession have kind of reached the end and have given up, you know, we need to respect that. Uh, but I, th I still think that in, in research, we've got to, it's slightly different. You are trying to find a kind of a truth. And uh, that does need, um, you know, persistence and single-mindedness sometimes. Um, that not not against in, individuals, but to find uh, reasons why people are in certain circumstances that might be due to cultural and social and belief systems. It is important to try and uh, bring that out. Okay. Now, a couple of other questions, David Mummery, and a couple of others come in. Now, it's not directly your subject, but you know a little bit, a bit about this. Is is um, there has been a definite, um, I think it's not new actually, but it's had a renaissance, is the, the use, uh, the, the, the belief that the immune system re represents a link between the mental and the physical, between the, psychi the, 
the psychiatry and, and physical disorders. Um, it was around when we were chit trainees, wasn't it? And it kind of went out of fashion, but it's come back in with quite a big bang. And obviously we should have Ed Bulbul here, but we haven't, we've got you. Um, do you think this is, I mean, it seems to be gaining traction and gaining evidence you know, as, a, as a kind of, of a link between the, as to say, our psychological world and then our physical world. Well, I think it definitely is mm. a link, perhaps the link between the, the psychological worlds and the physical world. Um, and uh, and we're, we're learning about it all the time. Of course, our response to COVID uh, and our understanding of that is, has become by necessity an understanding of uh, immune system and immunology. Um, so yeah, I think it's a genuine, it's a genuine science. And of course we've discovered new conditions such as the autoimmune encephalitides, you know, real neuro, hardcore neuropsychiatry, uh, <laughs> new conditions that we didn't, you know, have only just been discovered in the last decade or so, uh, that often present with abnormal behavior, delusions, hallucinations, and where ordinary tests come back negative, mm -hmm. and it turns out that there is some immune, an autoimmune process going on. So uh, one always has to uh, be open to those sorts of new discoveries. Um, but like all of those, it can be uh, simplified, oversimplified. Mm. And people can talk about their immune systems and uh, what's going on uh, in a way that's a bit simplistic and superficial and doesn't really, you know, is a way of avoiding understanding rather than uh, contributing to it. I mean, sometimes people talk in almost a metaphorical sense that I, I feel I have a strong immune system or a weak immune yeah. system. And I think uh, Petri in, in New Zealand showed there wasn't much connection between actual measures of immune function and measures of well-being. Um, but on that idea, so there you've got a good example of something that um, wasn't known when we started training. Now, um, uh, I've forgotten a name now in Oxford, isn't it? The, 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 the uh, professor there has done a lot of, of work on that. So suddenly we have a test and suddenly something has almost shifted, as it were, from the psychiatric into the either the neurological or the um, neural or the immunological and and critics of psychiatry are always pointing to examples like epilepsy. I think rather mistakenly, multiple sclerosis, you know, once they thought it was psychiatric, now we know that it isn't. Um, and there's, there's that kind of positivist, wiggish narrative that things will always move towards neurology. That's, that's I think, a bit unfair and also a bit untrue. Um, yeah, but, I, I agree. I think Angela Vincent is the That's person. it, yes, I Angela. Yeah. Think of, yes, absolutely. Uh, really yeah, brilliant scientist. I've had the, the, the privilege of uh, meeting a few times and working with at UCL yeah. amongst other places. So, so yeah, there, there is, um, yeah, but for, for every case of those, there, there are cases where um, you've understood things to be more complicated and biopsychosocial than were once thought. And I, I think um, the number of people who are mistakenly given a label of a physical disease as a way of sort of um, closing off the possibility of wider understanding, they outnumber those other cases, uh, you know, by orders of magnitude. And, and I guess if, if we had better ways of framing this idea that and, and in, in a way, the, the immune system does provide a very useful mechanism, as well as a sort of metaphor uh, that, you know, stress affects your immune system, which in turn can affect your body and stress hormones can actually shape and model the way the brain connections uh, form, which is true. It may be a convenient truth in some circumstances, but it is fundamentally true. And that can perhaps help people understand that, well, just because we think that there's a way of helping you overcome your disability that doesn't involve an operation or a drug, doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a, a disease of your nervous system and that you might not need, you know, your MS drugs. But it may be that your MS drugs are doing all that they can, but part of the reason why you're, you're not able to go out is because you know you have 
agoraphobia, and that's something we can treat with psychological means. Okay. Now, I don't know if you just noticed um, our dog appeared briefly on screen there, and I've now realized yes, that our dog is, is an extremely good timekeeper because she can keep quiet for about 50 minutes and then will appear. And so it's a bit of a warning that we're moving towards the end. But, um, but on that topic, I mean, I think we also we should draw attention to all those non-existent diagnoses that no longer exist, uh, chlorosis or visceral proptosis, chronic appendicitis, et cetera, which now we would see as manifestations of depression and anxiety. So it is very much a two-way street. Now, I can't help but bring in Anne Casement here um, because she's, she's actually made me realize what your actual discipline is. And she says, there's a discipline of neuropsychoanalysis founded in London 21 years ago by Mark Solms and uh, Jank Panksepp, who I, I don't know, actually, a neurologist and a psychiatrist. Um, she's asked us to invite Mark on the program, which is fine. But are you, are you yourself the first neuropsychoanalysis? You're, you've been doing this for more than 21 years. No, I'm, I'm not a neuropsychoanalyst. <laughs> and I, I, know, I, I know Mark Song's work very well, and he's a you know, fascinating and a brilliant uh, thinker. Um, no, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people can enjoy reading the historic case studies of the of psychoanalysts. And I think um, they have a lot to teach us still. Um, and the idea of transference, the idea of how you feel, how a per patient makes you feel is actually can tell you something very important about what's going on. I think th those are those concepts I found very useful, but I, I don't adhere to any psychoanalytic school. I haven't had a psychoanalytic training. So that would be wrong. No, no, I'm a neuropsychiatrist, which, as I said at the beginning, is a neuropsychiatrist with, you know, a little bit extra. Okay, so, well, that, I'd never do that. One slight comeback. It, it's certainly true. I mean, Anthony Clare was very good, wasn't he? Who, who go back over Freud's case histories and found them wanting in, in many levels, and indeed definitely see them as part of a literary canon rather than a, than a, a scientific canon. What... Well, how do you think your case histories will be read in 10, 15 years time? Which side of the road are they going to be on? Well, um, I suppose the fact that I tried to be honest about the, the successes and the, the failures will, will endear me towards historians. Um, and of, of course, these are stories that they're amalgams of different people combined uh, that, you know, partly because of worries about betraying anonymity uh, and partly because, you know, you, 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 there isn't even room within a book to tell the full story. Yeah. So it's not a historical record. Um, I suppose it will provide people with a snapshot of the way certain people were thinking at that time. And maybe we'll, we'll appear to be completely ridiculous. Um, yeah, I don't think so, though. Nor do I, actually, nor do I. Um, okay, so I've, I've known you for a very long time and admired you for a very long time, but I remember, let's go back to when we first met those years ago at the Morsi, and let's just remember what it was like then. When we turned up all those years ago, mm. there was a sense of optimism in the air, wasn't there? Do you remember there was um, someone announced had found the gene for schizophrenia when we were registrars, from, from UCL, by the way, but anyway, we'll pass over that. Do you remember the, the genetics that lived in a hut? There was a genetics hut, got a huge new spanking building. Scanners started to pour into the place and they got their huge spanking building, etc. But meanwhile, the kind of life of the hospital went on pretty much as usual. And I don't know if you'd agree with me, but actually the way that we, you know, you know, we've got computers now and we've got electronic records and a different mental health act and all that kind of stuff. But... It, the life of the hospital hasn't changed that much, really, has it? Is that fair? I, I, well, not for the better, but then, you know, <laughs> we, we, you're going to get two old farts yeah, I know. moaning no, about I, the NHS, which I don't think the... the, the lead, no, the, I didn't mean that. I meant that the, all those wonderful discoveries that have been made by you, and in fact, we have, there's several we haven't talked about, but we'll, we'll have to get back to about that. Your work on hallucinations we've not mentioned, which is staggering but all of the wonderful things done in those brand new buildings that's what i meant it's not that they haven't done things they've done amazing things but they've not influenced patient care oh i see what you mean yeah, yeah. sorry mm. 
I mean, that's, I suppose it was a bit hubristic to think that we were going to sort of crack these fundamental problems of, of the philosophers of agonized over for centuries. Um, I mean, I, I, I take a slightly halfway house view that things have really improved a lot since, since we started out. Um, just the quality of care is so much better. True. Um, and, and both you and I are slightly sniffy about awareness campaigns and all of that, <laughs> um, saying, you know, enough awareness, let's sort of do something. But I think if we're being honest, it is quite good that people are much more aware about mental illness and mental health. Yep. And stigma still very much there and, and is an elusive sort of quarry. It, it, it's perhaps um, in retreat. So all of those are, are, are very important um, advances. But yeah, we haven't had any major breakthroughs with treatment. And the brain scanning, all, all of that technology has told us so much more about how the healthy mind functions, uh, but it hasn't really led to particularly to new treatments. But I think, uh, you know, we, we've got to be patient and understanding mm. health is often comes before understanding disease. So I, I wouldn't give up completely. Where, where would you put your money then? Where, where do you think, where, where would you put, put your money as to... I mean, it could just be something completely random, like when they found lithium. But in, in a positive world, if you were really wanting to push one area that you think will make the first difference to patient care, a, 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 a sea change in patient care, as has happened in, in, in previous times, where, where would you do that? Where would you tell our previous guest, Kate Bingham, to invest her millions of, of venture capital money? Yeah, I mean, I think just psychiatry is different. It never happens like that because it's never about a gene that if only we found it, that would be the answer. Yeah. Um, it's always about that sort of messy biopsychosocial and that's a lumbering, complicated animal um, that moves very slowly. And so any breakthrough in one element isn't going to necessarily shift. So I think it's a sort of improved the knowledge and understanding across the domain of human knowledge, if you like, that will incrementally improve mental illness. I, I, I expect there's a few genes out there as well, though. Yeah, the problem is there's too many, isn't there? Isn't that there's what too, uh, yeah, probably our colleagues have shown? There's too many, but yeah, I think that's probably right. Now, don't go away, Tony. I need to make a couple of announcements. First of all, to remind people, tomorrow in, in our 12.30 lunchtime slot, we'll be looking at media reporting during the pandemic. Uh, Victoria McDonald from Channel 4 will be chairing it. Our guest, uh, Ivan Brown, from uh, you, if you remember him, he was a wonderful public health guy from Leicester, talking about what it's like on the ground. Robin Mackay, the science and environment editor of The Observer, and David Oliver, who's a general all-round medical politician and media star. So that'll be fun. And then this time next week, I'll hand over the chair to Henrietta Bowden-Jones, and she's going to be interviewing the great Tony Adams. And uh, although neither you or, nor I are Arsenal fans, Tony, I think we'd agree he is, he was a, a great player. And, um, and, but of course, he's had a life of both triumph, tragedy, and then back to triumph. So he'll be talking about that uh, addiction, sport, and, and much else. So that's going to be a, a definite must hear. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, Tony, to, to go back to you then, your, 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 um, your, your book is, um, do, you, do you remember what the, what the Spanish translation of your book is? I just saw that on, on, on Amazon. It's um, something like, um, as the, the brain is as deep as the sea. I think it's a deeper, actually. I think it says mass. Deeper I mean, more, more deep. Yeah, it's, yeah. Your Spanish isn't that good, but anyway. Yeah. But no, I think it's the brain is deeper than the sea. And... And I think your book is a, is a beautiful example of why that is true, because it, you know, it is just, and the stories are fascinating, your, your insights into what's going on in the brain. But lots of people have done that, but I don't think anyone's done it quite so beautifully by also placing it in the context of the family, the person, the marriage, the environment as well. So as I say, please folks buy it into the abyss. Uh, it's paperback now, isn't it? It's just come out as a paperback. So uh, much cheaper than the hardback, I must say, and, 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 and it's a great read. So Tony, 
thank you very much for, for doing this. We didn't get on to the decline of the hospital pantomime, but uh, it was one of the subjects we were also going to talk about. Um, now, in fact, do you want to end up with that? Tell us what's happened to hospital pantomimes. <laughs> Leave you with that yeah, last no, word. They're, they're, <laughs> nobody's got any time for it. They're, they're working yeah. far too hard, not like in our day. Yeah, true. And you, I remember you and I met a, a well-known comedian that way, didn't we? Well, our claim to fame is that we, we both knew Jo Brand when she was an actual mental health nurse. Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, there were, there were great times. And I, I do wish someone would revive the, the hospital. I do too. Of, I think we backed her in a band, didn't we? The worst backing band in human history. Thank God there was no YouTube then. Good. So, ladies and gentlemen, our thanks to Tony David. Thanks for listening and come back next week. Indeed, come back tomorrow. Good evening, everybody. And thanks again. Thanks so much, Simon. It's been a pleasure.